Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, my name is Stuart Marks. I work in the JDK group in the core libraries team. Oh, am I getting off the... All right. Stay, stay in place. Okay. Yeah, I work on the JDK core libraries team, and I am a JavaFX alumnus. I used to work on JavaFX, so I, I know a little bit about JavaFX. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, right. Are you kidding? So, uh, actually, quick question. Is somebody monitoring the Twitter stream or the IRC channel and yeah. for questions and stuff? So I'll, I'll I think this is a small enough group. We can probably take questions in line. It's probably the easiest thing to do. Um, so what I'm going to do first is I have a presentation, which is a brief overview of the new Lambda language feature and the Streams API that we introduced with Java SE 8 back in March. So this is really new. I'm you know, doing a lot of talks like this, educating people. Uh, it's a new language feature. It changes the way that you write Java programs. And so there's a lot of new concepts in here. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the language features and the APIs. And then uh, at the end of it, I have a little bit of a tie-in with JavaFX, where I wrote a little demo that does some interesting things, uh, combining a bunch of features of Java 8, new language, new libraries, and also some JavaFX stuff. All right. <clears throat> so what is a Lambda? A Lambda is a function. And so when you think about a function, it's like, well, what's the difference between a function and a method? Well, think of a function as a computation that takes some parameters and that returns a value. So it's much more of a, it's a somewhat more mathematical concept. Although functions can have side effects, we really, for a variety of reasons, like to avoid thinking about side effects. So you want to want to think about computations that compute based on input parameters and return some result. And that's not exclusively true. There's some things that don't return results, and there are things that have side effects. But that's fundamentally the way to think about functions. Now, if you think about functions, well, what's the difference between a function and a method? Well, in Java before Java 8, any computation had to be inside a method, which had to be inside a class. And the code had to be inside, well, the code was inside a method, and that method had a name. And you had to call that method by referencing the name and probably also the class in which it resides, or an instance associated with the class in which it resides. And so when we talk about lambdas, we c we're talking about a function that's, that's, that's not necessarily strongly connected to a named method in a named class. So it's a function, and once you've disconnected it from the uh, you know, from a close containment inside of a named method in a class, you can do things like take a lambda function and pass it around as a parameter, or return it as return value, or put it into a data structure. And you can st actually start to do manipulation on functions, which is something that is quite new for Java. There are other other programming languages out there that that um, that exhibit a much more functional programming style, where this kind of stuff is old hat. Uh, but in Java, this is all very new. All right, so I'm going to be uh, discussing, uh, discussing these new language features from the standpoint of using a very simple example. We have uh, you know, a plain old Java object, a person. It has some data elements and has a couple getters on it. Um, obviously, it's going to have constructors or setters or whatever. Let's forget about those. But we have a really simple person object. And we have them in a list. And a very simple programming task is let's sort that list. Um, and there's a library method called collections.sort, which uh, has been existing for quite a long time, and it sorts whatever the list is. But the person object has no notion of ordering relative to another person object. Um, and so the other thing we need to pass to the collections. Well, we need to pass a couple things to the collections.sort method. Obviously, we need to pass the list that's going to be sorted. But we also need to tell the sort method how to do the sorting, specifically, given any two person objects, how, how they can be compared so that as the sort, al sort algorithm runs, it's going to do a bunch of successive comparisons on the person objects and then rearrange them so that they are in order. So that's what those question marks are there in the, uh, in the second parameter of collections.sort. All right, so let's write a little method 
that does that. So we, let's write a compare method that takes two instances of a person object. And so let's say, just for the sake of argument, we want to compare them by name. So we get the gu first guy's name, call compare to on it, and get the second guy's name. So compare to is a method on string. So basically that, that sorts these name, that, well, that compares these names lexicographically or alphabetically, if you will, and it returns an integer minus one, zero, or one, depending on whether the first is less, equal, or greater. Okay, so that's all pretty, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, all right, so we have this nice compare method that does this computation. Notice it takes two person objects as parameters, looks at them, does some, does, makes some decisions, and returns a value. So it's a function. But how do, we, how do we get that nice function into the question marks? Well, in, in Java, before Java 8, we can't, at least not directly. We have to add some more stuff in order to bridge that gap. All right, so what we have to do is, like I said before, you have the only computations in Java had to be inside of named methods inside of named classes, or not necessarily named classes, but they had to be inside of a class somewhere. So we take, the, we take that nice compare method and make it be a method inside of some class. We'll just call it compare persons by name. But we put it inside of a class. And also, the, the way that, uh, just, just because of the, the way that Java's typing static typing works, we have an interface called comparator that defines the signature of that method. And a comparator of person is a method that takes two persons, compares them, and returns that integer. So we've wrapped this inside of a class that says compare persons by name implements comparator of person. And so this is all old stuff, nothing new yet, but this is sort of review just to get, every, get everybody thinking about what the issue is here. All right, so we have a class that is a comparator, and it has this nice compare method in it. We still can't pass it to collections.sort, because you can't pass a, I mean, the thing there, it doesn't take a class. So what do we need to do? What it takes is an instance of a class. So, so this is kind of weird, because we have a class, and we have to, to call new on it in order to get an instance of it. But but why? There's no state in the class. There's nothing. There's 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 you know there's there. <laughs> there's no value added. There's no semantics of calling new on a class. We already have this computation, it, and it could very well be a static method, but it can't just because of the way Java's static typing system is set up. The only way to talk about a piece of code is to wrap it inside of an object, and you need a reference to an object, and so the easiest way to get one is to call a constructor on it, call new on it, and so now we have an, a reference to an object, and then what comparator does is it calls the, sorry, what collections.sort does is, ah, now it has a reference to a comparator, now it calls an instance method compare on that. So if you think about this, we've had to deal with this in Java for quite a number of years. I mean, since, probably since day one, I think it's been this way, or maybe Java 1.1. There's this idea that in order, to, in order to talk about code, you had to have it inside of a class. And, and in order to kind of have a pointer to it, you had to have a reference to an object. So it's kind of a roundabout way of talking about a computation. A, I should say it's a very roundabout way of talking about a computation. Now, there, there's a bit of a shortcut. And this is kind of the standard idiom for doing this is, instead of having a separate named class that contains this method, we can have anonymous inner classes. And so we say now new comparator of person, and then we just provide an implementation of the comparer method. But that's essentially the same. All, all it does is it'll, it, it, it saves us a little bit of work. We don't have to come up with a, a separate name for this class, and it allows us to define this computation in line. So when you read this code, you say collections.sort, okay, we're sorting a list, and oh, there's all this anonymous inner class goop, but you kind of look in there, oh, there's the compare method in there, and you can see, ah, ah, it's comparing by name. So what you have to, so you can, at least you can put it there, as opposed to somewhere, you know, you know, way over there, where, you know, there might be a comparator, comparator class defined. So if you were reading this code, you'd have to say, okay, well, great, now what does, what does compare persons by name do? I mean, has a, has a descriptive name, but if you find out, if you want to find out what it's really doing, you have to go look at the code, which is elsewhere. 
Anyway, so this is the standard idiom, which is to wrap up these little functions inside of an anonymous inner class, instantiate that class, and then pass the reference to it there. So when you read this code, if you're used to code like this, you kind of skip past all the boilerplate, which I've kind of caused to fade out on this slide, and you look at the essential parts of it. Okay, so we have a function. It's taking a person, ob two person objects, p1 and p2, and it's saying p1.getName compared to p2. Oh, okay, ah, all right, so we know what it's doing. So it's taking, you know, again, it's back to this idea of a function. We're taking two person objects, we're calling a few methods on them and returning some value from that. So that's essentially what a lambda is. The syntax is very similar to getting rid of all the boilerplate. And so instead of the, the new comparator stuff, what we do is we say, write down the parameters, and that's to the left side of an arrow. And then on the right-hand side of the arrow, we have the lambda body, which in this case is an expression that's computed. So here we say collections.sort, list, okay, we're sorting the list, and how are we sorting the list? Oh, there's a, there's a function here, or there's a lambda here. It takes two persons and does this computation to compare them. So that's pretty simple. Now, it's, we can make this even simpler because when we're comparing a list of persons, the sort method requires a comparator of person. So the compiler knows this already. So why force the programmer to declare the types of the parameters? So we can say, aha, all right. Since the compiler knows this, we will have the compiler infer the types of P1 and P2. So this is a, an even simpler way to describe this function. So this takes two parameters, P1 and P2. Now if you really are concerned about this, you, you might have to pop up an IDE or something like that to tell you what the type of P1 and P2 is. But usually when you do this, the context is absolutely clear. You have a list of persons and you want to sort them, so how are you comparing them? Well, P1 and P2, you, you give you know, reasonable parameter names or something. The compiler figures out for you that they're instances of person, and you can just, you can just write this expression much more concisely. All right, so when can you use lambdas? So I use the example of a comparator, which is a special kind of interface. I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of special and it's sort of not. Comparator is a very old interface. It's been around for a very long period of time. But there is something that is interesting about it, which is that it has exactly one method. Strictly speaking, it has one abstract method, but we can talk about that later. So there's one method on this interface. And still, even prior to Java 8, there were other other cases where there were interfaces in the library that had a single method. And a good example of this is runnable. So if you look at the declaration of runnable here, there's one method on it, void run, takes no parameters, returns nothing. All that is is a computation. And that's used here if, so if you look in the center of the slide, there's the typical thing for running some code on another thread. So you say new thread, pass it a runnable, you know, new runnable, blah, 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 anonymous inner class stuff. But really, inside the run method is what you want the other thread to do. Okay, so if we get rid of all that boilerplate, you can look at the line of code on the bottom, which is new thread and then a lambda expression that takes no parameters. The run method doesn't take any parameters, so the, the lambda expression is doing the same thing, so it takes no parameters. And the way we say that is we, provide, we have to provide empty parentheses to say that it takes no parameters. So you say empty parentheses arrow computation. And in this case, we print out hello thread. So it's a much more concise way of writing the same thing that you, that you wrote using the anonymous inner class syntax. Now, I, I want to stress at this point that the implementation of lambdas is not is not the same as writing out an anonymous inner class. There's a much more optimized implementation that is a bit too complicated to talk about right now. We can talk about that later if there's time and if there are questions about it. Um, but the, the compiler can take a whole bunch of shortcuts here. In fact, it does not have to create, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to, it doesn't necessarily have to create a new instance every time. Uh, if there's some pre-existing code, it might be able to reuse it and so forth. So there's lots of shortcuts that the compiler and, and also the JIT runtime can take instead of an anonymous inner class. But from a, from a functional, or not a function, from a, 
from the standpoint of looking at what it does, it is kind of like creating an anonymous inner class. Because the usual reason for creating an anonymous inner class is you just want to pass an object that, that, that refers to some function somewhere. And so a lambda is a very convenient syntax for saying, oh, here's a function that I want you to run. All right. So anyway, so there's this concept of the functional interface, which has a single method. And so a lambda expression can be used wherever a functional interface is required. So we've seen a couple functional interfaces already. There's comparator and there's um, runnable. Okay. Now, in order to make Lambda more useful, we've added several APIs throughout the library that take new functional interfaces, or not necessarily new, but uh, new APIs that take functional interfaces. So we've added a for each method to where is 4-H? 4-H is actually on iterable. So anyway, so if you have a list of person and you want to print them all out, we can use the, the enhanced for loop, you know, for person p colon list print line. Okay, that, that, works, that works quite nicely. Or we can call the for each method directly on the list and then pass it a lambda expression. So, you know, that's kind of okay. It makes it a little shorter, but, you know, in, in some sense, who cares about this? Yeah, you make the syntax a little shorter, but it's a little more obscure. What's this arrow thing? Um, but there are some semantic differences. Now consider if the list were synchronized list. Now if you know what the, the, f the enhanced for loop does, for person p colon list, under the covers, what that does is it takes an iterator and it repeatedly calls has next next, has next next. And if the underlying list is synchronized, then each individual call to has next and next is synchronized. But between the calls, the list can change. And if that happens, then you might get a concurrent modification exception. So if you want to iterate over a list, you can't just do it this obvious, straightforward way. What, actually, what you have to do is you have to remember, oh, that's right, this is a synchronized list, so I have to remember to take a lock around or something like that. However, if you call the for each method, and that's one method on a synchronized list, and that takes the lock and holds it, calling the lambda for every single element in the list, and then it releases the lock. So there is a semantic difference here. And the point here is that there's a concept of external iteration versus internal iteration. And so the for loop is a good example of external iteration because here we are, he has some code standing outside of the list. We get an iterator and we repeatedly call into the iterator. And the list itself is kind of passive in that it's a, it just sits around and says, oh, okay, well, oh, somebody's calling has next on, on, on my iterator. Oh, do I have a next one? Yes, return. Okay, I'm done. Now I'll wait for the next guy to call. Whereas the for each loop actually runs, sorry, the for each method actually has a loop internal to the data structure. And this, this can be very important if the data structure is, uh, is at all complicated. Um, so if, you, if you're iterating over something like an array, the current position or the cursor into, the, into that, like an array list, is simply an integer. But if you have some weird tree which has some kind of uh, strange, strange kind of... Um, you know, strange kind of data organization. You have to have a pointer to an internal node and you have to make sure, well, okay, so if I have a, a list of children, I have to make sure I'm in the right place in the list. So the iterator for a very complex data structure can, can be quite subtle and it has to do a lot of checking to say, oh, okay, if somebody calls back into me, I have to do a bunch of checking to make sure nothing has changed in the environment. Oh, and if something has, then I throw concurrent modification exception. Uh, otherwise, okay, only then can I advance to the conceptually the next one. But with internal iteration, you can just have some nested for loops or recursive calls, and it just, you know, you just write all the iteration code in line, and it does it all in the context of a single method call instead of repeated calls into and out of an iterator. So even though the enhanced for loop versus list dot for each seems like a really small syntactic change, it actually is it. Under the covers, it can be very, very different, and that can be the library can take a uh, big advantage of that. All right, so 
Here, here's another example. All right, so I don't have a lambda on here yet, but let's have a task where we say, okay, we have a list of person, and we want to remove Jones from the list. All right, so let's write our enhanced for loop. If Jones equal to get name, oh, well, we have the person object, but, uh, well, you could go back and call list.remove on the person, but then it has to, you know, then it has to search the list again, and if it's way at the end, then it has to search all the way from the beginning. And Well, we don't want to do that, because we, we, we know we're right here. We should be able to remove it, but we can't. And this was a specific design decision about the enhanced for loop, and that it not expose the iterator. And that's, there's an FAQ on this somewhere. The, the answer escapes me at this point. But the way to do this using pre-Java 8 APIs is to actually explicitly write out the iteration code. So we take the list, get an iterator from it, and step through it calling has next and next. And then when we get to the elements we want, then we can call remove on the iterator. So that goes in, and, and that, that's how to remove something from a list that you are in the midst of iterating over. And so, OK, that's not too bad. But it's like, you know, what is that? Seven lines of code. Uh, yeah, seven lines of code. And it's, well, it's because you have to do the iterator goop, and it's a little noisier, and you have to parse through it for a while. And then you, you, know, you realize, oh, I see. It's looking, and it's removing every, every Jones from this list of persons. OK, so seven lines of code to do that. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you could say, hey, list, remove everybody named Jones? And that's what the last line on the slide does. There's a new API on list called remove if, and it takes a lambda that returns a Boolean. And if that Boolean returns true, it's removed from the list. Done. All right, so here's another example of where we added, uh, uh, added a new API, uh, replace all. Um, is this on, I forget if this is on collection or list. It might be on list again. But anyway, so we have, uh, instead, of a, instead of a list of person, we have a list of string here. And what we want to do is we want to say, uh, change all the strings in this list to uppercase. So Again, you, you, have to, you can't use the enhanced for loop. You have to write out the for loop using an explicit iterator and then call the iterators. Well, actually, the, there's, a, there's a different kind of iterator called a list iterator. And the list iterator has a set method on it. So that says, OK, so if you're at this point in the list, you can call set on it, and it replaces that element right there. So that's what that does. Um, so once again, we can replace that loop with an internal iteration style of that loop using, uh, using a lambda. So we say list.replace all, and then this takes a different kind of lambda. So since this is a list of string, what we want is a lambda that takes a string and returns a string. And so, so s is our string, and so s arrow s.2 uppercase. You can imagine putting anything else on the right side that results in a string. So if you want to change it to lowercase, or if you want to change it to return only the first three letters, or you know, s.substring, or whatever. You can imagine anything that you want on the right-hand side of that. Um, and in fact, that kind of idiom where we say, write out a lambda that just calls a method on, on its argument is so common that uh, we have a different syntax for that called a method reference. And so this is a new, yet another new syntax, which is the double colon syntax. So this might uh, cause, uh, cause the, C, the, the C++, C++ programmers or the former C++ programmers in you to give a little bit of shake, because it is reminiscent of uh, C++ here. So, but basically, this is a, a shorthand for naming a method. And it's not actually, I mean, it's, I think it's one character shorter in this case. But there are some times where it, uh, I, I need to come up with a bit of an, a better example here. But sometimes simply naming a method using this method reference syntax is a lot clearer than writing out a lambda. And I think, I think it works both ways. Sometimes it's, it's, it's much clearer or simpler to write out a lambda expression instead of using a method reference. Uh, and I think since, since this is all so new, we're working out the right kind of style rules for when to use uh, uh, method reference versus writing out a lambda. But uh, it's another option if you, if you want to pass, if you want to pass a lambda that all it does is call some method, it's, it's really nice to be able to just name that method. All right, so I kind of blithely gl glossed over this, and either you already know the answer or, 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 uh, or, you, or you let me get away with it, which is I said something which was, oh, we just, 
added a method to the iterable iterable method or, or we added a method to the iterable interface. We added a method to the list interface. Well, we've never done that before. And the reason is that that has long been considered, and in fact, it, has, it, 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 it is an incompatible change. So if you were to add a method to an interface, then you could still compile and build a system. The problem is anybody who called that method wouldn't know if the... Uh, the implementer of that had been augmented with the new method or not. And you don't find out until runtime. So if you have a class library uh, that you have a bunch of implementation classes that implement an interface, and then you say, oh, actually we left something out. Let's add something to, the, to this interface. And then you hand it to your users. Well, they say, oh, great, this is a nice interface. It has all these useful methods on it. Well, if you forgot to add an implementation of that method to every single implementation class, then you'd get, what would you get? Uh, abstract method error. And so you'd have to do a lot of code auditing and so forth. Uh, and in particular, if there were third-party code that you did not have control over that implemented this interface, then you, know, you, you wouldn't be able to release your software until everybody was updated and so forth. So in general, in the JDK, we have avoided adding refer uh, excuse me, adding methods to interfaces for exactly this reason, because you can't guarantee that everybody has, um, has provided an implementation, and therefore you cannot avoid abstract method error at runtime. So, um, so anyway, we created a new, uh, actually I'm getting ahead of myself here a little, well, I'll just talk about this a little bit. So basically we create a new language construct called default methods. And so it enables us to add a method to an interface, but since it's, uh, it's the new feature is that we can add the implementation along with the method declaration in the interface. So if you add a, method, if you add a default method to an interface, it comes along with an implementation, and so any implementing class that hasn't overridden it will use the default implementation. But as time goes on and your implementation classes, uh, your implementation classes can override the default method, and usually this is recommended so that they can provide an optimized implementation based on their internals. Uh, but it's compatible because it's, it's just like overriding a method in a class, in that if there's one higher up in the chain, then if it's overridden, the overridden, the overriding one takes uh, precedence. Um, but if if the subclass does not provide a uh, uh, an overriding implementation, then the one in the interface gets used. And there are a couple extra rules, not too difficult. I'll just I'll just mention it here. If you have a a class in your superclass chain and default methods in your interface in your interface ancestry, and they match. The class, the implementation in your class, superclass hierarchy always wins. And so default methods are, uh, have lower precedence in that sense. So if you have a class and there is no implementation of this method in its superclass chain, but there is a default method, then the default method gets used. So anyway, that's how we get around this issue of incompatibility with adding methods to interfaces. So once we have that, we can say, ah, oh, let's go wild. <laughs> let's, let's add all these useful stuff that we've wanted to add to these interfaces all along. And so, so here, we, these are the ones I talked about already. So there's iterable.foreach, collection.removeif, list.replaceall, and, and list.sort. And actually, there are a bunch, bunch of others. Um, I should get a catalog of these at some point. But... Um, uh, so we, actually, we didn't go wild. There actually is a problem, which is that uh, if you were to, and in fact, it's actually analogous to adding uh, a method to a uh, superclass. If you add a method to a superclass that clashes with something a subclass already has provided, then that is an incompatible error. And in fact, you can't, you, 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 there's no way around it. You have to recompile the subclass. So what we did is, we, we, we actually made judicious use of this feature in enhancing the interfaces in the class library. So we think these are generally useful. There are a couple places where we actually noticed some code bases that had subclass, say, list, 
And so we said, oh, maybe we should choose this other name that doesn't appear to be used as much. So, um, so we tried to avoid known incompatibilities, but there, there are potential incompatibilities still out there. All right, I wanted to talk about this last one a little bit. So I started off talking about collections.sort. And I'm sa now I'm saying, OK, well, we add an extension method to list called list.sort. Well, what does this buy you? So collections.sort is a single algorithm. And what it has to do is it has to be able to sort any list. Now, it, it still takes a comparator, but that's not what I'm talking about. Collections.sort knows nothing about the internal organization of the list. And so in fact, what it does is, if you look at the implementation of collections.sort, it runs through the entire list and reads it out into an array, and then it sorts it, and then it takes that array and then loads it back into the list, which is, which is potentially pretty expensive. So it has to do all this extra copying, because it has no idea about the internals of the list that it's being passed. Now, with list.sort, since that's a default method, and it can be overridden by any particular list implementation, and in fact, in our library, we have done that, right? So, so ArrayList, we have, you know, ArrayList overrides the sort method and says, ha, I have an internal array. I'm just going to do a sort in place. No copying. So, so that that's provides an optimized implementation there. So again, the theme here is it looks like it's just a little syntactic change. But in fact, the, the fact that we have added default methods to the, to the language and we use them in the library means that the code is actually much more optimized than it would be otherwise. OK, so now I'm going to take a step, uh, a step ahead here. I've talked about various operations on collections like remove or replace all or whatever. Um, but suppose we wanted to do some operations on collections, but we wanted to combine them somehow. Like, um, you know, instead of replace all, maybe we want to replace only some of the items based on some condition. So, so there was like remove if that took some kind of conditional. Uh, and then there's set all, or replace all, that, that replaced all of them, but we want to combine these, like replace only, only certain ones. And if you were doing this using uh, collections, you'd, you'd ha you might have to you know, write, if, write some nested loops with some conditionals in it and build up temporary, uh, temporary collections. And you know, you'd, you'd read some stuff out in a temporary, maybe sort it, and then read it back out and process it and store the results in, a, in, a, in another collection or something like that. Um, and so this is a common enough problem that we decided that it would be nice to be able to compose a bunch of these operations in a very flexible way. And so what we did was we came up with this idea of, of streams, which is a way, a very fluent way of composing um, operations. Now, streams are not collections, and so they're, they're very, it's a very, very abstract concept. And I, my, my best definition is a stream is a multiplicity of values. And that doesn't tell you very much, but it's, it, there's a lot of information packed in there. Uh, multiplicity meaning zero or more. Um, so you can have, uh, you can have zero, you can have zero, it, it can have zero values, or it can have one, or it can have a finite number, or in fact, it can have an infinite number. So it's not necessarily bounded. The second thing is I wanted to stress the point of values here. And in fact, this is Java. They are either primitives or objects. That still exists. But since we're, since we're moving over into a, a more uh, parallel-based functional style world, it's best to try to distance ourselves from objects that can be mutated. Because when we do all these kind of operations like this, if you're, if you're changing the state of, a, of, a, of an object, if you, are, if you are mutating it, then you have to think about, oh, well, which thread is doing the mutation? Or what order are these going to occur in? Because if you do this operate, if you make this change and then that change, that might work. But if you do those in the other order, it might break. So instead, what I prefer to think about is to talk about <laughs> values. So we have, we have primitive values like int and long, double. But we also have uh, value objects, like string is the best example of that. So string is an object, of course, but it's immutable. And so if you say substring, 
it doesn't change the string. What you get is a new string that has different contents in it. So a string is like a, a, a value type. So this is, this is going to be very important in Java going forward. There's a, lot more, uh, there's a lot more discussion going on about how to support values as objects better in future versions of Java. But the point here is that streams are very good at manipulating values. And if you write side effect code on using streams, you can very easily get yourself into trouble. So we want to avoid doing side effects. OK, so streams are not like collections. In, collection, in a collection, if you have a list or a set or something, every single one of those objects or values exists and is contained within that set. And they all, they all exist. Uh, whereas a stream, those objects might be created on demand. They might be read off the network. They might be instantiated based on the previous one. They might not exist yet. Or they might be a collection. So a stream is much more abstract. So the objects, we can talk about a stream containing objects, but it's not really the same kind of strong notion of containership that collections have. Um, Uh, streams might or might not be ordered. And so I think a good analogy here is between a list and a set. Right? So if you have a list, there are objects, you know, if you walk through a list left to right. But if you have objects in a set, or if you have values in a set, yeah, if you iterate them, you'll get some particular order, but the ordering is, is, is not significant. And in fact, it's defined not to be significant. Because if you change the contents of a set, you, you, the, the ordering of unrelated elements might change as well. You know, if, if, if you have a hash set, it might do a rehash or something like that, and things might end up in different buckets. Uh, and that's very important for parallel processing. There's a, there's a large class of problems where you want to do processing on all the elements all at once in parallel, and you actually do not care what order they're processed in or what, what thread processes each one. So the stream has, uh, has an, has a, it's, is an abstraction that might, where might, excuse me, a stream is an abstraction that might or might, cons might or might not consider ordering to be significant. Now there are there are times when you do want ordering and stream. If you if your stream is ordered, then the most of the operations are order preserving. So where order is significant, that is carried through. But if a stream is not ordered, then the framework can take advantage of that and do things out of order if it's more convenient for it to do so. And thereby, you might get uh, higher performance. So I've heard people describe streams like uh, an iterator on steroids. And it's sort of like an iterator. You can take a stream and it's sort of like, OK, just read out the elements one at a time. But the whole point of this is to enable parallel processing. So the other thing you can do with a stream, and this happens a lot with you know, inside the library, but there, there, is some, there are some APIs exposed about this. You can take a stream, remember, that represents zero or more values. And you can say, process this in parallel. And so you can, you can sp conceptually split up the contents of the stream and have a bunch of threads operate on them in parallel. All right, so the API for streams is based around three, three things here. So we have a source of values. We have zero or more intermediate operations. And then we have a terminal operation. And so you put all those together, and you get a pipeline. Uh, let me run through some examples of what these are. So uh, we have our usual suspects for sources of values, like collections and arrays. Um, you, can also, you can also just use the var args. There's a method called that constructs a stream based on a variable number of arguments, which actually, under the covers, turns into an array anyway. Um, but there are also some other things, like you can, you can create a stream that's a, that's a, a range of integer values. And those inter integer values don't actually exist until somebody, uh, somebody asks for them. So, um, so streams are referred to what is laziness seeking. So computations don't necessarily occur until they're required to. Um, you can also have a stream that is the source is, say, the lines out of a file or a network socket or something like that. So you might have a stream of values that is coming out of you know, some I.O. operation. Um, all right, intermediate operations. There are a bunch of things here, but they're sort of, you've sort of seen examples of them before. Like, so filtering is saying, you know, selecting which values we want to process and which ones we want to discard based on a Boolean expression. Mapping is saying, OK, let's take one input and return a, a different input. 
based on some computation, right? And so our example of that is, you know, string to uppercase, right? So it maps a lowercase word to an uppercase word. Um, distinct and sorted, it's like you, if you have a stream of values that might contain duplicates, distinct will compress out the duplicate values. Uh, sorted, uh, basically it's like putting, if you guys are familiar with Unix pipelines, I mean, this is starting to seem like, uh, seem like Unix pipeline. It's like, oh, I have some, you know, grep or whatever. Grep is like filter, and you can say pipe to sort, pipe to something else. And that's exactly what sorted does. You have a, you have a set of values coming in, and you can sort them by their natural order, or you can provide a comparator. It sorts them, and then, and then the output is a stream that is, uh, that is fed to something else. Um, skip and limit allow you to uh, take a, a, a slice of, of a stream, you know, take from the fifth to the tenth elements or something like that. Flat map is an interesting one. Um, I don't know if I have an example of this later on, but, but basically uh, there are a lot of things where you take one input, you have an operation in the middle of a stream, you take one input, send one output, one input, one output. Flat map the, the idea is you can take one input and produce many outputs and then sort of you, you don't want to you don't you don't want to have a stream of lists now you want to actually just stream out the contents of that list so i can have something that takes one in, one input and provides two values for output or i can have something that takes one input and provides one output or i can take one input and provide zero outputs sometimes I, and it can change from from one value to the next so flat map uh, the idea of flat map is that it 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 um, it decouples the number of input elements from the number of output elements. Um, all right, so those are intermediate operations. Terminal operations, we have a bunch here. We can, um, I mean, the obvious ones are for each does some operation on each element in the stream. You can collect all the elements of a stream into an array or into a collection. Um, you can do things like count the number of elements or find the, the, the smallest or the largest. Or there's, uh, there's a new concept. And it's, well, it's, it's old to anyone who's done any functional programming, but it's, it's kind of new to Java, is this notion of reduce, which is reduction is taking many values and reducing them all to a single value. And so there are ways to do that. And then there are also some searching operations, like you know, find the first one or find any one, uh, or or running, uh, running a Boolean expression on all of them to say, I want to make sure that all of these stream elements match, or I want to make sure none of them match, and so forth. Um, all right, let me get to some examples here. Um, so this is how you write streams code. We're going back to our list of persons, and I'll just make up some little, uh, little example here, which is, um, I only want to take the names that are longer than three characters, and I want to generate a sorted list of them. So the first thing we do is we take the, the, the person's list and turn it into a stream by calling stream on it. And then, so what we have now is a stream of person objects. And we map each person object into its name. So, so that's a lambda. And oh, actually, the whole point of streams is that all of these operations are driven by lambda. So you can see now we're, we're doing lambdas up the wazoo here, right? So we have stream operation. We're doing lambda this, lambda that, and so forth. And so we say, OK, so a mapping operation, one in, you know, we take a, a person object as input, and we return the name as the output. So now we have a stream of strings, which are the person's name. Next, we do a filter. And, and actually, I, I, I'm playing to the international audience here. The usual thing is, oh, well, isn't the length of the string s dot length? Um, well, it isn't if you have supplementary characters, like if somebody has an emoticon in their name. Uh, or, so, um, so anyway, so this is, this is a new bit of API, which is how many code points are there in, uh, in this stream, and, or in this string? And if it's greater than three, that returns true. So those are, the, those are the names we want to list, right? So remember, the problem statement is take the names that are longer than three characters. So, uh, so the filter returns true if, if the number of code points is greater than three. The ones that are fewer than three are simply dropped. So now what comes out of filter is strings that are longer than three, three code points long. Now we sort them, and then for each, we just print them out. All right. Um, slight variation on this is, remember I talked about method references before. Uh, so here we just use the method reference syntax instead of s arrow 
system out print line, we say system out colon colon print line. Otherwise, this is the same. Um, so sometimes you might want to do something other than um, you know, print, printing them out or, or doing some, some for each operation here. Uh, there's, uh, there's a big API inside of collect, which I don't have time to, to discuss in detail here, but sometimes what you want to do is do some streams processing, and then once I'm done with them, then I want to send all the results into a new list. And so that's what this does. So we say, you know, we have a, we have a pipeline, and if the last thing is collect into, there's a new API called collectors, and what that does is that's a that's a function that consumes its input and returns a list that contains that input. So we have here a list of strings sorted names. I should say sorted names longer than three code points. Um, all right, here's a different kind of example. Uh, it does a mathematical computation. So a um, bunch of things going on here. But basically, this does the Taylor expansion for pi, which is a very slow way to compute pi. Uh, but what we want to do is say, well, what are, how, do you, how do you compute the terms of this? We can say, all right, let's take the numbers. Well, we don't want to run infinitely because we want the computation to stop at a certain point. So let's say, take the numbers one to a billion, and we are using longs here. So a long stream is a stream, but instead of a stream of objects, it's a stream of long primitive values. So we take... We take a range from 1 to a billion, and we say, OK, map each long value into some fancy computation you see on the right hand. Basically, what that does, that, that deals with odd numbers with alternating signs. <laughs> so if you puzzle that through, it starts off with, it start, OK, so long stream dot range 0, comma, end of range gives you 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. And if you if you apply this function to it, you get one, you know, one minus three, five minus seven, nine, and so forth. So that gives the alternating odd numbers. And then now we want to do the division, but at this point we don't want to do division using the longs. We want to use floating points. So what we do is we we map it to a double value and put you know say four divided by whatever that whatever that alternating sign odd number is. And so now that's, that's the Taylor series. You know? And so you can, see the, you can see the expression up at the top. So we have the alternating sign odd numbers being summed up you know, and with you know, four divided by each of those. And then the terminal one, so sum is, is, is a convenience operator that takes every one of those double values that's coming down the stream and just adds them up. And the result is a single double value. And so, in fact, if you run this, you get something that's, you know, pi to about eight digits or so. And if you change the, the, the range up or down, you can tell that, you know, if, if you only compute it like a thousand iterations or something like that, you get a very bad approximation of pi. But, you know, the more, the more doubles you add to this range, the closer it is to the, to the actual value of pi. All right, now here's the trick. There's another method on streams which is parallel which is uh, basically it says, well, remember, we had that range of 1 to a billion. And actually, this is a bit of a finesse here. It, in, in pra for, this, for this computation, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But really, mathematically, if you're adding up a bunch of numbers, then there's no requirement that you start with the first one, add in the second, add in the third, add in the fourth. If you have a bunch of processors, you can say, okay, you take the first 100,000, you take the next 100,000 of those, and do all your computations, and do them all in parallel, and then once you've added them all up, you have a merging at the end that, that, that merges the results together. So if you set aside the notion of, I think this is actually a fairly well-conditioned mathematical operation. So the, when I was running this, the, uh, the results for sequential and parallel were we're pretty darn close. In fact, I didn't, I'm not even sure there is a difference. There is a problem if you add up floating point numbers in, in, in different orders, you might get different results because of loss of precision. But uh, in general, there's a large class of problems where you don't care about the order in which things are done. And so adding the parallel call invokes a whole bunch of extra machinery in the streams API that says, OK, let's farm these out to a bunch of threads, do a bunch of computations in parallel, and then merge the results at the end and, 
and return the result. So the operations are actually being done in a different order because they're being done on different threads. But if you compare this to, say, the, the bare threading code, And we're back. You're back? Okay. All right. Well, I just... Uh, when did it click off? I think I was at my summary slide anyway. <coughs> All right. So I, I talked about a bunch of this. I don't need to go over it very much anymore. But I think that the, the main thing is that... So adding lambdas to the language lets you talk about... You know, from the language level, it lets you talk about functions and computation in a completely different way from the way you used to before. And what this enables programmers and library writers especially to do is write completely different kinds of APIs. And so our first example of that is Streams API, where we say, let's compose this chain of operations that are all parameterized by lambdas. And so if you can imagine, actually, a very few people used to do this. Uh, before lambdas, they would actually write libraries like this that used anonymous inner classes. And, you know, <sighs> It was useful, but it was also horrendous to program because you're constantly creating all these anonymous inner classes or, or stuff like that. But lambdas makes it really easy to, to pass hunks of code around and as parameters, return as parameters, compose operations together, and it, it changes the way you program. All right, so uh, let me post some links up here. Uh, I can come back to this later, but this is all the usual stuff. We have a bunch of stuff on oracle.com. Uh, we have some tutorials. The source code, this is all done in the open. This is OpenJDK. So you can actually go down, go to OpenJDK and pull down the sources and look at it, see how it's implemented if you want. The, the, compi the Java C compiler is there, so you can see how lambdas are compiled. Uh, the library's sources are all there, so you can see how streams work. Um, there's an FAQ and some uh, state of the lambda, a couple state of the lambda documents. These were updated several times during the evolution of the system. Excuse me, they are now reached their final state, but they have a lot of rationale for why the things are the way they were. Or, excuse me, why, why things are the way they are. All right, now... Um, yeah, for, for anyone who, who missed yeah. this slide, I'm pretty sure Irene's going to tweet the picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I can put this back up after... No, no, so some, some point. Well, well, we have a record online. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is all pretty well known. So what I want to do now is switch over to uh, a demo of, of uh, a, a little demo program I have here. All right, so let me... Oh, am I me? Oh, okay, yeah. So, so are, you getting this, uh, are you getting this video now? All right. Yeah. Yeah, right. whatever's on screen is exactly what goes live. So, okay. yes. All right. So, all right, I think this will have to do. All right. So, let me a uh, little bit of uh Let's see. Where is Where the heck did I put my main program? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So let me tell you what this is doing. So, all right, so I, this is a real, uh, you know, this is one of these little tasks you have, uh, you know, in your ordinary, uh, uh, you know, ordinary day-to-day -day activities. What I wanted to do is, so our bug database is JIRA, and I wanted to, and JIRA is nice because you, 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 there's a very flexible uh, querying and filtering language, and you can generate a lot of charts and stuff. But... I wanted a chart of historical bug data in different states, and Jira could not give that to me. So it gives you a can of set of charts, but I wanted to create my own chart. And so I've done this in the past. Okay, this is pretty easy. Just take your query, extract the results. Uh, I'm an old Unix hack, so grep or awk, you know, cut some stuff, cut some columns out, or do some, you know, sed to, to do pattern matching and stuff and then send the results to plot. Or maybe now that we're in the 90s, everybody has Microsoft Office, you roll it into a CSV file and bring it into Excel, 
and tell Excel to create a chart from that data and you can produce a pretty chart. And I was, I was about to dive into this yet again. I've, I don't know how many times I've done this sort of thing. And I said, wait a minute, Java 8 can do all of this. So I wrote a program and it was actually, you know, I was going to dust off my Perl skills. Like, oh, how did you do, you know, I always have to look in the manual again to figure out how to do particular kinds of things. So I said, well, I can do this all in Java. And so uh, let me, I'll just show you a little, uh, where's my, oh, when it resized, ah, here we are, when, when I changed my screen resolution, it made all my terminals six by eight or so. Okay, so this is the output of, of my query. And so it's this, it's this XML stuff. And what I really wanted to do was, um, so, ah, okay, here we are. Here's an example. What I really wanted to do is extract the creation date. So I, I, wanted to, I wanted to do some analysis over the lifetime of bugs. So every bug has a creation date. And then for the bugs that are resolved, there's another element in here which gives the date that it was resolved. And then if it's not resolved, this is simply absent. So for every bug, get its creation date. And if it's resolved, get its re resolution date. And then put that on a graph and get a count, a running count of the number of open bugs on every day in the past. So that, that's what the task is. So I didn't do XML parsing for this because it turns out that uh, this is all line-based XML. So, so I did this cheap hack of saying, oh, okay, so if it has created dot star created in it, then that's the line that I want. Um, so let's go back to my IDE. So here, so what I do is this is the, the core of it here. So I open a file and start reading lines out of it. And right here, I say, okay, so for each line in the file, there's, oh, where's, oh, okay, so up at the top, the, uh, where's, where's that? Oh, the pattern, aha, the pattern string is, ah, that's right, the pattern string is a, a pattern, uh, is, is passed in as a parameter. Okay, so basically it's, it's something that matches either created or resolved. And so for each line, I map that into a matcher. And the result of calling pattern.matcher on a string is a match result, or a matcher, I guess. Uh, and then I say, okay, well, what I want is... For each, for each of those results, you know, some of them matched something and some of them did not. So I only want to, I only want to look at the ones that matched something. So I call filter here and I say matcher.find and that returns uh, a Boolean that says whether it found something. Um, and so the output of filter here is uh, the matchers that represent a line that did match something. Okay, now I call map on it again. I call matcher.group to extract the, and there's some, parenth if, well, you know, it's a typical regular expression thing. I have a parentheses around some, some, some bits of the regex. So I want to extract a little bit of that, which turns out to be the date here, which is this part. Okay, whoops. All right, so what I, what I did here in this, in this call to map is I extract the date. Okay, now this is a call to the new Java 8, java.time API. And so it turns out that these dates are in, well, I, since I'm an old Unix hack, I said RFC 822. Oh, RFC 822 has been updated by RFC 1123. So it's actually officially RFC 1123. So... What I can do is I have a, a date string, a date and time string in this well-defined format, and I can, in one line, I can call our new java.time API, and it gives me a local date object based on parsing that. Okay, so now I have a stream of local dates, and what I want to do is I, I want to collect them into a collection. Uh, and then this is a little bit of magic here. So, so instead of collecting them directly into a collection, there's this thing called grouping by. And this magic here says, given a date, grouping by, instead of putting the dates into a list, 
it puts the results into a map. And the keys of the map, and so here I have a lambda expression d arrow d. So this is the identity function. So it takes in a date and returns a date. And so that's how the, that's how the date is computed. So what I do is the keys in the map are the dates. And then counting is another, is a, is another bit of magic. But what that does is, is suppose you have multiple cr bugs created on the same date. What counting does is it says, OK, well, if there are several of them, just, just increment a counter for that. So the result of collecting and grouping by is a map from dates counts. So, so on, okay, so if you pass in the pattern for matching the creation date, what this gives us in, you know, there's a little bit of wrapping for opening the file and whatnot, but really in about eight lines of code, I can get a map that says, on this day, four bugs were created. And on this other day, zero bugs were created. And on this, other, well, actually, there's no zero entry. It's just absent. On this day, one bug was created and so forth. And, you know, I, I've written that logic somewhere else a couple times before, and it's like, oh, you have to handle the edge cases. Okay, so put it into the map. Oh, wait, what if it's already there? You got to get it, and you got to add one to it, and then you got to store it back, and, and, and things like that. And so this, it's, all, it's all handled for you. Um, so this is the example of, of streams code. And I think I'm running long here, so I'm just going to uh, switch over to the... Uh, uh, Let's see, is this worth going through? OK, so, so that was the bug dates thing here. So, so, uh, so I, have two, I have two mains here. One generates a CSV file. And so basically, I ask it to generate the code and just print out comma-separated data. So that's, that's pretty simple. But then I have a JavaFX program here. And it's a lot more complicated. But if, you, if you're a JavaFX programmer, it's sort of you know, usual JavaFX stuff where we say start, set, the, you know, get the stage, set the title, but now I'm going to be doing some charting stuff. So I create some number axes, set the chart title, blah, 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 blah. But the work is done here. So I call the same bug dates dot generate and it gives me, it, it gives me this data. And what I do is I've written a little Lambda expression here that converts it into data for an XY chart. And then once I've done that, I plug it into the scene and, you know, Set, show the stage. So, so let me run this, and you can see what it looks like. All right, so we get a nice pretty graph. So we have three data series, which is the number of bugs that have, the cumulative number of bugs created, the number of bugs resolved, and the net number of bugs remaining open on any given day for the past, you know, 3,000 days or whatever. Uh, so this, so the bottom, the bottom axis is time-based, and you know the different colors are the, the number of bugs created, uh, number of bugs in any particular uh, state. All right, so uh, Steve, you want to switch over to your uh, demo now, or you want to? Um, what do you? Yeah, wanna? yeah, we can switch, but this might also be a good time for questions. Okay, anything coming in on IRC or Twitter or? Everybody? Yeah, I asked on IRC. I assume it's working, but I... Oh, <laughs> okay. So we got it very, ah. very nicely done. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and for folks on the stream, they can also send stuff via Twitter as well, if they'd like to. We're monitoring Twitter and the IRC chat. But, I mean, in the room here? Yes. Hey, Keith, give us some... Um, so I have a... Some people footage. A couple questions, actually. Yeah. Uh, first, can you go a little bit in more into more detail around the the precedence of inheritance, specifically oh. around the default methods? Yes. And if you have multiple interfaces, right, with the same default method, how oh. is how is that? How are we dealing with the diamond problem? Right. Okay. Yeah. Good question. All right. So, uh, yeah, that went out. Yeah, you got a mic. Okay. So, so really, there are two rules. I glossed over one of them. So one is class wins. So suppose you call a method. OK, so you have a class, and it has a superclass and multiple interfaces. And if you look up in all the ancestry of the interfaces, you might find default methods. And of course, you might also find the same method if you go up the superclass chain. So f first rule is class wins. So if the method is found in the superclass chain, that's the one that's called. And uh, 
the any default methods occurring in the interface hierarchy are are overridden. Now, let's say there's no method in the superclass chain, and you have multiple default methods occurring in the uh, in the the in the interfaces that are inherited. If you have an interface that if you have an interface that extends another interface, then the the most specific one wins. So if you have and that's you know kind of ordin you know obvious inheritance rules. Uh, so if you have uh, a sub interface that overrides a default, it has a method. Sorry, if you have a sub interface that provides a default method that overrides one in its super interfaces. Okay, so that covers one set of cases. And then another one is if you go up different paths in your inheritance hierarchy, and if you find multiple matching default methods, that is a compile time error. Uh, there was a bunch of discussion about, oh, well, let's see, uh, how, you know, maybe have some metric about how far up the inheritance tree you go, or, or which was rejected. <laughs> uh, how about the declaration order of, of, of interfaces, right? And yeah, okay, so I'm shaking heads here. I think C++ does that, right? So there's, left, there's this left to right ordering, and so you can get all kinds of weird effects. We said, no, we do not want to make I mean, that's never been the case in Java, that if you inherit multiple interfaces, there's no semantics to the ordering of that. They all get, uh, they, all, they all get combined equally. And so if your default method occurs in multiple paths up your interface inheritance hierarchy, that's a compile time error. And so a cla the class that introduces that must disambiguate. And so it has to provide its own overriding method. And then there's a way, if it wants to call a superclass, there's a new syntax for saying, if you have interfaces x and y, you can say, I think it's x dot super to say, I want to call my super interfaces default method on, you know, on the x interface instead of on the y interface. So OK, I, I have yeah. a related question. Ah, OK. So what if? You have something which was compiled against interfaces where only one of them had the default method previously. And then the one of these super interfaces which existed in, let's say, another library, they added the the same method, which is now a compilation error, but assume the class was compiled before the change was made. Sorry, I think you have to be a little more specific. <laughs> um so there are there there are actually a couple cases there because you have to talk here you have to start talking about binary compatibility versus source compatibility. Yeah. So so the typical problem is suppose you have a method that has uh, I'll just make it up. Suppose you have a method x that has a return value of string. And then uh, then that has a sub interface. Somebody creates a sub interface that calls meth that defines method x that has a return value of int. So if you were to try to compile those, that w if you tr try to compile those together, those that would be a compilation error because you cannot override a method and change its return value. However, that case can occur in separate compilation, and that is actually binary compatible because if you look at the bytecode level, methods are disambiguated by parameter types and return value types. So when you do an invoke virtual then there's enough information there for the JVM. It, de it depends on, on which, you know, what your code was compiled against. So that situation, even though it's incompatible at the source level, if you make those modifications in separate compilation and then combine them, the VM can disambiguate them. Is that, was that the case? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was a binary compatible. Yeah. Well, and it's a binary compatibility question because yeah. you're pre-compiled right. the right. source, which depended upon the the right. diamond case. Right. And in fact, that's I, I think that's the same in in classes as in interfaces. I think there are a bunch of wrinkles which which elude, the details of which elude me, which come up in interfaces because there are just some extra cases and there's some subtleties there. But uh, but that's the that's the gist of it. This is all this is really in edge case territory here. So yeah yeah yeah. But so that's the fun part. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Other questions. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, also, oh, okay. how would you how would you write a method signature that would accept? a lambda as a parameter? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so, so when, you're, 
when you're writing, yeah, when you're writing a method that wants to accept a lambda, basically you're taking an instance of that functional interface type. And so, so for instance, like if you look at the, if, if you look at the definition for the thread constructor, it takes a runnable. And, and that's it, right? It, in fact, you can't tell. So, so if, you're, if you're writing a library and you're accepting something as a parameter, all you do is, is, is write the, you know, it's like taking, it's an ordinary parameter that is taking uh, a reference of some interface type. And if that interface type is a functional interface, meaning it has only one abstract method, then callers can write a lambda. And as, as the callee, you just have uh, a reference to an object that implements that interface, and you can call the method on it. You can't tell. And so, in fact, you can't tell if the, the call, so if you set it up this way, your intent might be, oh, anybody can write a lambda and pass it in here, and that's good. Uh, but you can't tell if they wrote a lambda or if they passed you an anonymous inner class, or if they instantiated an ordinary class that happened to implement that interface. As far as you're concerned, you have a reference to an interface and you just call a method on it. Yeah, so, so there's <laughs> I forgot to show it because there's nothing going on on, on, the, on, the, call, on the callee side. I mean, it, it's, it's completely, it's, it, it's very ordinary. Um, but that's a good question because I was focusing on the caller side because that's where the big change is because you can now write a lambda instead of uh, anonymous inner class. Yes, question. Pass the mic uh, behind you. Um, do you have any experience with retro lambda at all? Because Android port does not support JDK 8 right now. And that's yeah. one of the things that they're thinking about using. I'm just wondering if you know if it's the same. No, Retro Lambda. I've heard of Retro Lambda, but I actually don't know anything about it. So, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I use that for one of my applications to take, well, what I'm going to show you now and get it working on Android. And it, hmm. it works quite nicely. I mean, like Stuart was mentioning, there's multiple implementations the JDK team went on Lambdas. Some of them didn't actually require JVM level changes. They just based on inner classes and existing functionality, which is how Retro Lambdas does it. Um, you're just not going to get some of the performance benefits and the, uh, you know, a lot of what Stuart was talking about that you get from using the built-in Java 8 Lambdas implementation. Ah, question. So besides streams and JavaFX, what other major libraries are extensively using lambdas in Java 8? Um, well, that's the main one. I think I showed you some of the extension methods, or excuse me, the default methods that we've added to the collections API. So, so really the stuff that uses lambda the most is streams plus sprinkled around the class library are default methods, most of which, not all. I mean, default, default methods are really separate from lambdas. I mean, it's a completely separate language feature. But we found that since we really wanted to change the way the library, people program the library, a lot of the default methods were added in such a way that they accepted lambdas. And so the, the first part of the talk where it's, you know, list.remove if and, and, you know, list.sort and those guys. So, so there are a lot of default methods that accept lambdas. And, um, I don't think that there is that much extensive use in the rest of Java today because, you know, it's new enough that, uh, um, you know, we, we, didn't, we haven't yet gone through and updated all the other APIs to, to, use, uh, to use Lambdas. Uh, what we did do, actually, there's, there, <laughs> there, was this, there was this idea. I mean, obviously, we want to do that, and we did some of that, and we started off calling it Lambdafication. Uh, which is, oh, okay, let's upgrade the APIs to use Lambda. And we quickly realized that we didn't actually want to do, I mean, sometimes Lambdafication was the right thing, but what we really wanted to do was streamify things. And so what you'll find sprinkled around the libraries is in many, and there are some places missing still, but in many places where there is some notion of, you know, getting multiple values or multiple objects, uh, 
you know, those, what, what those things would do in the path, well, in, you know, what those things would do is return an array. And sometimes arrays are difficult to deal with. And, and in some of those cases, we said, oh, okay, well, since we're returning multiple objects, let's return a stream of them. And then, oh, well, now you can just do all this filtering. So, so I want the, you know, I want the ones that only match some criteria. So you get the stream and you filter it and off you go. Uh, whereas before, you'd get the array, and you have to step through the array and say, okay, well, either process each one or, or you know, conditionally load them into a list and then do some processing later on and, and on all that usual stuff. Uh, so there's more to be done. I think the, uh, if you, I think a, we don't have a really good list of places where we've enhanced the API, but if you, if you go through the class libraries, the, the Java doc is upgraded a little bit too. So instead of having, um, Instead of having, like in, at the top of each class, there's, um, you know, there's a method summary. And there, it's, it's now tabbed. And so you can get a list of default methods, and you can get a list of static methods, and so forth. So you can categorize them. And so if you ever see, most, most of the things we've added are default methods. And so if you're looking at, like, the collection classes, and you hit the default methods tab, it's kind of surprising what you find in there. And, and I, occasionally, I still stumble across something. It's like, oh, they added that there. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> um, so for instance, look at the map interface. There, there are a couple things like uh, uh, there's compute if absent, which takes a lambda, which performs a computation only if the, the key value pair is not there. Uh, there's another one, get or default. How many times have you had to do that? It's like, get this. Oh, if it's null, oh, or if it's null, but the value might actually be null, so you have to say, if it's null and the map doesn't contain this key, then return this default instead. Okay, getter default returns it in one line. Uh, and in fact, that doesn't even use lambda, right? That's just, that's just a convenience thing. Uh, because in fact, uh, if you look at the implementation of getter default, it actually has this very subtle condition in there, which handles the null case properly. So anyway, so there are a bunch of things like that. So look at, look at the, the map interface. Actually, in most of the most of the interfaces in the core libraries, if you look at look at the default methods on there, there's some there's some little gems buried in there. Any other questions? Um. Yeah, it's on GitHub. Oh, I didn't put the link on my slide. Yeah, this is on. Oh, that's right. This was yeah separate. Yeah, but it's on GitHub. I'll I'll I'll. I'll no, uh, it's no. I'll, I'll I'll tweet a link to it. Okay. Yeah, and his Twitter handle is just his name at Stuart Marks. If you're not already following him. So what I was thinking, because you know we have a little bit of time, but I realized actually I have more stuff I can show, and we don't have a talk lined up for next month. <laughs> 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 so save it for next month. <laughs> so what I was thinking, we could do. So this is some of the stuff which I was using for my my motorcycle tour. So I have a, a demo of um, Java running on Lego Mindstorms, um, some development boards, and the Duke Pad, which is a homebrew tablet. And then, like we were talking about, retro lambdas and running on Android. So I have an example of running on Android with retro lambdas and a Java 8 example. And that's actually the other thing I wanted to talk about today was to 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 do to show to show this game. So it's essentially a JavaFX, a small JavaFX game that uses best practices um, for coding with lambdas, and also it gives you examples of the Stream API visually. So some of the stuff Stuart was already showing with Flat Map and that stuff. So how about, like, I'll bring all my toys, and then we can do a meeting July, beginning of July. Yeah, so I'm actually here <laughs> for a change, which makes it a good time to do a meeting. Um, so I think the first, are we, are we shooting for first Wednesdays now? Anyway, that would make it around, I don't know, July 2nd or July 9th. Keith and I will figure it out and post on the Meetup site. Ninth, ninth. Okay, so tentatively July ninth, so you guys could enjoy the holiday, the July fourth holiday. Yeah, so I'm putting up my whole calendar to the world, aren't I? 
That's great. Um, yeah. So let's do that instead. And that way, if people have questions for Stuart, we have a couple extra minutes now. Oh, and we have to figure out an equitable way to give our, our jet brains license of the night. So, um, how do we want to do it? Maybe you can come up with a <laughs> tricky, tricky lambda's question. But that's something that was covered in your material. Sorry, I don't have any good ideas. Um, you, you have a good one, Keith? A zinger? Yeah, I come up with a question for people. <laughs> yeah, so how many IntelliJ licenses do you need, Keith? You, got, you guys know what his new car is, right? 400. Yeah. Although plus, plus you did training on the racetrack recently as well. Although Steve, your motorcycle might be able to beat him, right? No, the motorcycle I rented. Oh. In Europe, could. Oh. Okay. Possibly. <laughs> yeah, the the one which was backfiring today and is about to blow up. Why don't you place the Lego Maestro picture with your Dookie picture? Um. Yeah, I should. I should. I'll work on that. <laughs> All right, I, I'll, I'll ask a random one. So, which which interface is the replace all method on? <laughs> Yes, winner. Actually, I, I looked it up after you mentioned it. He he said it was he said it was either on list or collection, and you were leaning towards list, and you were right. It okay. actually is list. Okay. So we both answered the question. You're right, and okay. we also answered a question during the presentation, yes. which we weren't sure about. Very good. Yeah, it probably it's we we skimmed skimmed past it, but. Okay. Cool. Congratulations. All right. All right. Now with that, any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on the oh. Okay. One that. of the last slides that you had, um you had this really cool um collect method that you're um and then you provided this had this really nice convenience function called counting. And how oh. do you add other functionality like that? Or is that just the, you only can use the ones that are supplied? Okay, I know that's the wrong answer, but I'm guessing. Oh, are you? Uh, I'm rejiggering. I gonna, oh, okay, I see. All right, I, but if uh, you have it up, it will pop up on screen shortly. Okay. Um, shortly-ish. Shortly-ish. Am I? Am I mirroring? Now you're up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Where was that? That was over here. This one. Yeah, that counts. Yeah, collect grouping by. Okay, there's a, there's a big. Okay, so I'll talk about this uh, a little bit here. So there's a big, um, there's a big set of APIs underneath collect. Okay, so there's this idea that, and and it's actually pretty complicated. In fact, you give a whole talk on it, and one of these days maybe I should. Um, so collect is a terminal operation on a stream, and the initial intent, and it, and it does do this. Uh, the initial intent is to say, oh, okay, well, we want to take the results, or we want to take the values coming down the stream and put them into a collection. So there are some, uh, <coughs> so so sort of the the initial, the initial evolution of the API was instead of having a general collect method being the terminal operation, we just had something like to list, or to set. Uh, and then maps are a little difficult because, well, we want to, you know, how do you generate the keys and the values? Okay, so, so those, that was kind of the initial thing. And then what happens is, you know, when you're API designers, you say, well, which instance of set, or which, which, which set class should we use? Because um, inevitably, if you pick one, somebody's going to say, well, well, I don't want that one. I want my own, or I want a different one. So we started saying, okay, well, 
instead of saying to set, what we want is kind of a generalized notion of collecting the values and putting them somewhere. And what happened was this evolved into the notion of a collector object. And the collector object doesn't have any state itself, but it has some functions that describe a recipe for how to collect values. And so one of them is essentially a constructor for, for the data structure into which the values are going to be put. And so you can pass a reference to a constructor. Like if I, want, um, uh, if I wanted to collect all the elements into a hash set, I could say dot collect, and then inside there I could say collectors dot to set, and then I could pass in the hash set constructor. Or if I wanted a tree set instead, I could pass in a tree set constructor. OK, then now let's talk about maps. OK, so there's something different going. Right? So if you have a list and a set, OK, so those are pretty, those are pretty easy. You have, those are kind of, uh, those have, they're kind of linear structure. You just have values. OK, so collecting into a list is, um, well, actually, there's a bunch of complexity there when you consider how to do it in parallel. But let me not talk about that yet. But conceptually, at least, you can write a collector that says, OK, I am going to collect things into a list. So the library doesn't, I mean, there's a def I think by default it collects things into an array list. But there are some overloads that say, I want the caller to be able to specify what kind of list to collect things into. And in fact, I want the caller to be able to specify how things are added into this collection. So, so what you do is you start writing more lambdas. You can say, I want to collect things into a list. And you can pass a reference to the ArrayList constructor and a reference to the add method of ArrayList. So what that does is the collector says, OK, I have a value coming down. And oh, I don't have a destination yet. Call the constructor. OK, so now I have a destination. Now how do I add this value into this destination? I'll call the next lambda that the guy passed me. And it's the add method. And so you can imagine that if you have some fancy data structure that's not one of the standard list things, you could just write a few lambdas that specify how to, um, uh, how to, you know, how to construct a new thing of your own data structure and a recipe for how to add things to it. And in fact, on, on Stack Overflow the other day, I answered a question. It's like somebody said, how do you reverse the elements in a stream? So I had a variation of a collector that said, OK, well, I want, to correct, I want to collect them into an array list, but I don't want to add them sequentially. I want to add them in reverse order. So if you say add 0, comma value, that actually adds it at the front. And so that has the effect of adding every, every element to the front, and it, and it reverses them. So the effect is you get, you get the list in reverse order. Um, now, maps. You have some extra stuff to do with a map, because when you want to collect things into a map, you have to pass a function that says, OK, I have a value coming down the stream. What key should it be stored under? So you, have, you pass in a function that says how to, how to map. Well, <laughs> what function gets called in order to generate the key from, that, from the, 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 the element that came down the stream? And then you also have a different function in general that gets called to, uh, to generate the value. So there is a, there is a collectors.toMap method that takes two lambdas, one to generate the key and one to generate the value. All right, so that's pretty, OK. And then actually, there's another one, which is you can pass in a constructor for the map so that you can choose what, what class of map gets instantiated. OK, so now, so you can tell this is getting to be a really rich API. And so, so, um, so if you actually look at the, the collectors, there's a collector interface and a collector's utility class that has a bunch of canned collectors in it already. It's actually, it's actually pretty complicated. It's kind of hard to understand by reading the API. But this is sort of a, a roadmap to it here. Um, so if you look at collecting things into a map, so you need a key generator and, a, and, a, and the value generator. Oh, well, what happens if you have two elements in the stream that end up at the same key? Then what happens? OK, well, so the default policy is you're collecting things into a map, and you call the key generator and the value generator, and you do a put. But if there's a collision, then what do you do? So by default, if there's already a key in the destination map, it throws an exception, because that's kind of the least, uh, that's the, 
that's the least unsafe <laughs> uh, policy to choose. But obviously, that can't be the only policy because sometimes you want to you want to do things and you have you have objects coming down the stream that you do want to have be under the same key. Now you have a different problem, which is you have mul multiple values that you want to merge somehow. And so that's what grouping by does. So grouping by, there's a single argument, um, there's a single argument version of grouping by, which is just the key function. So you have a value coming down the stream, and it runs the key, key function to generate the key, and it puts an entry in the map for it. But instead of having a single value entry, it builds up a list of values. And so that's how you can get a, a you know, in, in one line, you can get a categorization. So for instance, if you, if, you had a, if you had a bunch of words, you can build up a map by categorizing them on the first letter. And so you could say grouping by uh, s dot substring 0 comma 1. So you take the first letter of that, and that would be the key of the map, and then the value in the map would be the list of words that had that letter as, as the first letter. So it's really s a really quick way to build up a categorization like that. But that's sort of, that's sort of a restrictive policy if that was the only thing you could do is accumulate a list. So instead, we want to be able to have a merging function that says, OK, well, if there's already a value in the, in, sorry, if, if, you have the, if you run the value mapper and you put a key value pair in there, but there's already a value there, how do you merge them? And so that's what counting does. Counting says, oh, OK, actually, we don't want to put the values in there already. What we want to do is, if we're putting the initial entry in, we just put a 1. But then if we get another key value pair and there's already a value in there already, it adds 1 to it. And that's something, so you could write out lambdas. Essentially, this is, it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's another extension method on map called map.merge. Uh, that's what this uses, which is essentially it says, invoke this. If you if you want to, the problem with put is it simply overwrites what was there before. So often what you want to do is you have a policy where you have a key value pair. If that's not present in the map, you just put it. But if it is present already, you want to take the the old value and the new value and merge them somehow. And so counting uses map.merge, and basically it converts everything to integers, and what it does is every time a new entry arrives in the same key, it just adds one to the value that's already there. And there's a whole bunch of other ones there, so you can do, um, you can have all kinds of different policies for how to, how to construct maps inside of this whole collector infrastructure. But that gives you a flavor for what's going on, because it actually is a fairly complicated problem. Because you, you really want to be able to, you, you don't want to have the library set policy about, you know, what, what kind of map to use, what kind of set to use, what the merging policy is and stuff. So all of these things are programmable with Lambda. So there's the, there's the simple ones that provide some default policy. But if you want a different policy, you can, you know, there's an overload that takes additional arguments that says, oh, in this case, call this Lambda to compute what, what would go there instead. So that's, that's kind of what's going on under the covers there. Yeah, question. Let's see, do you yeah, get the mic over there? Yeah, um, this is regarding the streams itself, and uh, mm -hmm. it is regarding the parallel part that yeah. you were explaining earlier. So is it like multiple threads, or how, how is it implemented? When you say parallel, are you saying like there will be two threads, three threads? Right. What, what does happen there? Yeah, OK. So. Um, <sighs> Let's see, a bit, bit, uh, bit of history. That, well, OK, so I think the simple way to do it is there's a, there's a thread pool. Basically, it runs the threads in a thread pool. And, and in fact, the, the, in, in Java, in actually, it started in, I guess, Java 5. And in basically, there's this package Java called Java Util Concurrent. And that, that was introduced in Java 5, and it's been enhanced several times since then. Uh, but basically, that provided... You know, in <laughs> sorry, in the beginning of Java, there was threads and locks and wait and notify, and then so with Java Util Concurrent, 
There's some more abstractions for creating thread pools and dispatching tasks to thread pools. And then in Java 7, there's a different kind of thread pool called a fork join pool. So it's a thread pool, but what it is, it's a, it's a thread pool that accepts fork join tasks. And so the pool not only is just a pool of threads that executes things, but the, the point of a fork join task is that one of these tasks knows how to split itself. And so you can say, oh, I have a workload here. I'm going to throw a fork join task at it. And part of the creation of a fork join task is the ability to split the workload and to merge the results. And so in Java 7, if you had a parallel workload, like if you wanted to work on an array of something, the typical thing was have a fork join task that represented a range of the array. And then if the framework decided that it would be split, you could say, oh, I'm going to split my range in half and then create two fork join tasks out of that. And then some splitting would be done, and then there would be intermediate results. And then those intermediate results would be merged, and then there would be a merge, func merge you know, a function that merges the results in the fork join task. OK, so what does that have to do with streams? So streams, like I said, ha are a multiplicity of values. And so in the ideal case, you have a bunch of values that can be operated on independently. And so if you say parallel, what it does is that looks at the stream source and it says, oh, do you know how to split yourself? If you do, then it wraps a fork join task around it and submits that into fork join pool. And then the, the fork join pool looks at the number of processors that you have available on the system. And it says, oh, if you have eight CPUs, then it's going to do enough splitting to keep those eight CPUs busy. So there's no, there's no use. I mean, if you, have a, if you have a million elements, there's no use splitting that up into a million separate tasks. Right, and, and running a million threads or something like that, right? So what it does is it splits it down far enough. And I think it, you know, there's some policy about how far it splits, but I think it splits like one extra level just to make sure that there's, there's enough work for, the, for each of the threads to, to work on. Yeah. Hmm? Factor yeah. of like, I think four or eight, which it uses in the code. Yeah, I don't know the particulars of the splitting policy. And, and in fact, there's some heuristics in the splitting policy as well, where it, it works for a broad range of things, but it's, it's actually not that difficult to come up with, with things that kind of don't fit the profile. And, and as a result, those don't necessarily parallelize all that well. Um, but that's kind of the art of parallel programming, which is you know, how, do you, how do you figure out how to keep all your CPUs busy? Um, but the main, the main effect of this, all these, so, so, <coughs> so anyway, so this is all built on top of the fork join framework. And so if you look at Java 7, and I think there still is an example in the, I think it's in the class doc of the fork join pool. There's, there's, uh, there's the simplest possible example of using a fork join pool to, to run something in parallel. And it's like 20 or 30 lines long. And, you know, doing anything reasonable in a fork join pool involves a fair amount of bookkeeping because, you have to write a fork join task, and there are a bunch of a uh, bunch of methods you have to implement to figure out how to split yourself, and how to join results, and various ways to invoke things and whatnot. And if you if you anyway, there's a fair amount of complexity to take some arbitrary workload, and then you know modify it so that it fits into this notion of a fork join task and which makes it splittable and mergeable or well forkable and joinable that's really what that's all about so anyway if you have a stream of elements then the the f you know in a in the java 8 streams api the streams framework itself is responsible for dealing with all the fork join tasks and submitting into the, into the fork join pool. So what you see is you see your values going in, and then they get processed by all the stuff under the covers, and all the merging gets done under the covers, and you you just get your result. So is that is that at a good enough detail for you? Yeah. Okay, good. Any other all questions? Right, so I'm gonna question. Okay, I'm gonna call it. I think I think okay. we've done a good job. It's right. like <laughs> one one hour forty five minutes. So thank you very much, no, Stuart, okay. for an excellent thank presentation. Thank you very much. Um, congratulations on our JetBrains winner. Everybody else is responsible. Oh, we have to give that away too. Uh,
<laughs> you've, been, you've been waiting for like two years to get one of these, haven't you? <laughs> All right, so and our next meeting will be, what do we decide on? The 9th? The 9th of, the 9th of July? So thanks very much for joining us. Have a good evening. Take lots of goodies home with you for your kids, coworkers, neighbors. We d we don't want it, we don't want to carry it back and forth again.